so Mark had to go pretty deep into the bullpen this week since he and Richard and Taylor are all gone. So it was up to, as Sam called it, the B team to make sure the Sure Grove ship continues to sail. Uh, but luckily for you all, the average age dropped by about 20 years or so. So that's, that's I guess, a positive sign for all this that's coming. Uh, so this morning, what I'm going to be kind of talking about is life resolutions. Now, I know some of you are like, Jason, it's uh, January 20th. The new year was three full weeks ago, pretty much. And yes, I know, but I think resolutions are always a really good thing to talk about just because it's about changing who we are. It's about changing our life, making it better. And I think that really applies to our walk in Christ, right? Uh, and also, I'm going to be touching on motivation. You know, what motivates us? How are we motivated? I think when we know what that is, what is that motivation for us, I think it's a lot easier to implement those resolutions in our life. So, first question I have for you, and I want to raise the hands, which should be honest. How many of you have made a resolution this year? Raise your hand. Actually, not that many. Okay. So, keep your hands up. Hold on. Keep your hands up. How many of you are still going in that resolution you made? Okay. Wow, so good work so far. You're, you're three weeks in. Congrats. Uh, so I have some stats up here that I'm going to show you about resolutions. Uh, as far as I know, I think it was just done in the Northwest. It may have been done nationwide. but So what it is, is if you pull up the first one for me, 62% of citizens make resolutions or have at least made one in their lifetime. And that, I guess, was a little skewed for our congregation because there's only about 60 of you that raised your hand. Uh, but only 8% are successful in keeping their resolution the entire year. Now, I thought that was really low, but when I told Mark that, he was like, oh, no, I thought it would be like 3 or 4%. So I guess he's a little more pessimistic than I am. I thought it was going to be around 15%. The next one is 38% of all resolutions are weight-related. So eating healthier, working out, you know, jogging more, whatever it might be, 38% of all resolutions are weight-related, which I thought was pretty interesting. Uh, and then I gave a couple success of rev resolutions by link, so if you'll pull the next one up. So after one week... 75% of people are still going strong. So that means 25% can't get to a week, which that's, that stinks. Uh, and then two weeks is 71%, so not quite as big of a drop-off, but still 29% can't make it to two weeks. And then one month, 64% of people are still in it, so that's pretty good. Not a huge drop-off from two weeks to four weeks, or one month, four weeks, yeah. And then six months, 46% are still going. So when a half a year is done, more than half the people that have made a resolution are done. So it's just kind of interesting to see that stat. And, you know, I'm guilty. I'm like that too. You know, and, oh yeah, by the way, those were all f found from statisticbrain.com. Just in case you want to stat check me, I know some of you are. I want to make sure I got all my things in order. Uh, <clears throat> so we're all like that, right? We, we want to do something good in our lives. We want to change something. And the first couple weeks, man, we are, we are strong. You know, we're, we're motivated. We're intense. We think about it. We're constantly aware of it. But if any of you are like me, once life starts getting going, you kind of get a little lazy on it. You might skip a day here, skip a day there. You're like, well, I'll make up for it on the weekend, or, well, I'll eat this piece of cake this time, and, you know, I won't eat it next time. And we start getting, really, we start getting lazy. You know, we start forgetting our resolutions we made, and <clears throat> our old habits and our old selves start coming back to life, right? Just because that's what's comfortable, that's what we know. So that kind of takes over again. And like I said, I'm, I'm like that. After two or three weeks, usually I'm like, is it, is it worth it? I don't know. And so usually I'm, I'm in that probably two weeks to one month thing, so I'm part of that statistic right there. Uh, but it makes me think of the verse in Romans that Paul talks about, or the verses, I should say. So if you'll pull that up. Okay, so this one, you've got to hang with me. This is a tough read. I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So did you follow all that? The do's and the do's and the doing and the do's and the do's? Did you get all that? So that really confusing stuff, but I think it's pretty true, right? I mean, how many of you can kind of relate to that? Be like, yeah, I, I get that. You know, we know when we're doing good, right? We, we can feel it. We can sense it. You know, usually a lot of times we get that joy and that excitement from it, but we also know when we're not doing the good, as Paul says. You know, we, we hate what we're doing, but we're still doing it. And that's where, as he calls it, the sinful nature, you know, old habits, all that. 
Now, I'm not saying that not keeping your resolutions is a sin, but hopefully you can make the connection and see what's kind of happening there. That's, that's who we are as people to kind of go back to our old ways, go back to our old habits, even though that's not how it necessarily should be. And so how do we combat this? That's going to be, the, I guess, the question that I ask. Like, how do we combat our old self? You know, what, what does that look like? And the word that kept popping in my head was motivation. You know, for some reason that was the word, motivation, motivation. So I think if we know our motivation, we're more likely to implement our resolutions in a way that we can succeed. I think that's really important. So what I want you to do for the next five seconds, it's going to be silent for five seconds. I know some of you that's going to drive you crazy. But for five seconds, I want you to think, what is it that motivates me? So ready? Five seconds. Think of that question. Go. Okay, so hopefully you have that in your mind now. So just kind of think about this as you see other people's responses. So this is, I asked my Facebook, you know, my Facebook friends, what is it that motivates you? And these are some of the responses I got. Others relying on me. That's what got some people, you know, if, if somebody needs me to do something, that motivates me. Making others happy. That was two or three people said that one. They really desire to make others happy. That's something that motivates them to succeed. Humility shown by others. So when someone else shows humility, that motivates them to do the same. Being successful, the feeling of accomplishment. That was three or four people I think that said that. Just, you know, knowing that you did it. You know, I'm, this is a success, or I, I finished this, I accomplished this. That's a motivation factor. Helping others and serving. A couple people put that, put that one up. That's something that really motivates them if they can help somebody, I guess, get that other motivation, success, accomplishment, all that stuff. Uh, someone else put pursuing my passions or interests, which I think is a very important one probably for all of us that we are seeking after what we enjoy, because I think God put that in us. Traveling, being able to travel, that's a motivation to do things that need to accomplish so they can go on their next trip. That was somebody's. Uh, and then a couple people wrote, God's faithfulness in their life, knowing who God is and what he's done for us, that motivates them. And also, God's plan for our life. That's what motivates them. They know they can continue to do good because they know what God has in store for them. <clears throat> so those are a lot of different things, right? And probably some of you all, when you thought, maybe you have the exact same one up here, maybe it's something entirely different. And that's what's kind of cool is that God created us. He's so different that we have different factors that motivate us into accomplishing things for his glory. So I think that's okay that we have different motivations. Uh, so, you know, like I said, there's a lot of different ways to do this, a lot of different ways we get motivated. And so I'm going to give you a little insight of who I am and what motivates me, Jason Toy. Uh, so there are three things that motivate me, but two that are, I guess, more natural, more I was born into these motivations. And the first one is when someone openly doubts me or says I can't do it. That's when I go into, like, hyper mode, and I'm like, okay, I'll show you. I guess I have just enough of a competitive streak to where I want to prove them wrong. It can be something as little as a board game or, you know, a discussion we're having or something as big as something you're doing in life. If someone, like, was to come up to me and be like, I don't think you can do that, Jason. I don't think it's possible. Now, obviously, if you're joking with me, I'll probably be able to recognize it, but if you were dead set that I cannot do it, you probably flipped on the 110% Jason, which doesn't come out all that often, but you put that on. So if you ever really want to motivate me, come to me serious say, you can't do this, and you might get it done. So, but don't abuse that, people, okay? That's... that's it's out of the goodness of my heart that I'm giving you this. Uh, but my example for this is, so way back in 10th grade, okay, it really wasn't that far back ago. It was only like six or seven years. Uh, but I was uh, in math class, and we were going to our final, and our teacher was Miss Schneider. You know, me and some of my friends call her Schneidy. I'm sure she loved us for that. Uh, but we're in her class. We're sitting down for the final. One of her rules was if you do not have your calculator, you don't get to borrow anybody else's. So I don't know if some of you know, it's pretty easy to like write notes in calculators or share answers in calculators. So that was a pretty smart rule on her part. So for some reason, this particular day, the day of my final, I forgot my calculator, left it in my locker. So I'm sitting in there and I'm like, oh, dang it, I forgot my calculator. Well, we'll see what happens. I think I'll be all right. Math became pretty easy for me. So. so she comes up, she's passing out tests. She looks at my desk and she goes, where's your calculator, Mr. Toy? I'm like, oh, I left it in my locker. And she's like, well, just want to remind you, can't use someone else's. I was like, oh, I know. And she like, as she was walking away, she kind of out of the corner of her mouth said, well, I guess you're the dumb one for forgetting it, and kept passing it. And I was like, oh, is that so? I'm the dumb one. Okay. And then, you know, like I said, she openly doubted me. She called me dumb, saying I would not be able to accomplish this test. So, like I said, hyper-motivated Jason came out. And, man, I flew through that test. You know, we had an hour and 40, hour and 45 minutes, I think, for the test. I think I was maybe done in 30 minutes. 100 questions. 
I was just going through it, man. I was in, in the zone, so to speak. I was going. So I turn in, 30 minutes, she looks up at me and she's like, are you done? I was like, yep, I'm done. I go back and sit down. And I knew I did really well on it. So we go to Christmas break, two weeks later, come back to school. She's passing them out. You know, and she's like, well, the highest grade for the final this year was a 98, so congrats to the two that got that. And guess who one of the 98s was? That's right. <laughs> Redemption was mine. So, and then she asked, you know, when you're d- done looking at it, come bring it up. And, you know, obviously, since I only missed two answers, I didn't have to take very long to look at my test. So I went back up, I put it on her desk, and I was like, oh, not so dumb after all, huh? And I dropped it, and I was like, yes, God, oh, it felt so good. You know, I, I, I showed her, right? I'm sure she cared a whole lot. But... That's something that really motivates me. When someone openly doubts me or says, you can't do it, I'll go. You know, that's something that gets me going really quickly. And so that's one of them. The second one that's really natural for me is when that people I trust, a group of people, tell me they need me or they tell me that it can't be done unless I'm a part of it. So that's something that also gets me really really motivated. And I also have a story for you on this one. Uh, So my junior year of college, which actually was only about three or four years ago, uh, I was in a club called Gamma Sigma Phi at ACU. It's coming around the time for uh, elections, for officer positions. And there was a thing called the top four in our club, which was the president, the vice president, the sergeant at arms, and the sibling father. Those were the big four, which had to be seniors to hold that position. Everything else could be juniors or seniors. So we're, as we're getting closer to this time, I was going to run for president against a couple other people, and there was another position called the sergeant at arms, which had two or three guys running. But the top four above us, the four seniors that were about to graduate, individually each sought me out and said, Jason, I know that you want to do president, but I think you would be a better fit as a sergeant at arms for club. You know, they kind of explained to me that the other candidates that are in president can handle that job, but the other candidates in sergeant at arms, they weren't as sure they could handle it. You know, they weren't belittling those people saying that they were incapable, but they truly thought that I would really succeed in that role and I would really help club. And two or three of them actually said, club needs this. You, you need to do this for club because without this, who knows what could happen. <clears throat> the reason why they said this is because the sergeant at arms is the pledge master, so to speak. So during the six weeks of pledging, sergeant at arms is in charge of making sure everything is going, making sure everything's operating. You're in charge of the 30 to 45 pledges that are wanting to be in your club. You can tell them what to do. You can tell them how to do things, all that f- crazy stuff. Uh, so the position requires a lot of discipline on your own part to not abuse that power. You know, to not get so power controlled that you want to make them do things that are against the code at AC, the code of conduct. It also requires a lot of leadership because you are not only controlling club for that six weeks during pledging, but you are also controlling those new pledges. And, you know, you're teaching them what it means to be a member of this new, of GSP, of Gamma Sigma Phi. And the third thing you needed for that position was some intimidation factor because you're supposed to be able to like tell these siblings what to do. And so if they don't see you as a figure of authority, it's going to be kind of hard to tell them what to do. And luckily, God blessed me with a six two and a half, six three frame, about 225, 240. So that came pretty natural for me. I just had to stand there and everybody was like, wow, you're big. And so as I kind of thought about this, you know, I was like, well, maybe, maybe I should run for this. You know, maybe if they really think that's what club needs, maybe I can be that guy. Because I've always been one who I'm okay with sacrificing for the greater good. You know, I've always said if, you know, I don't know if any of you have heard this analogy, like if someone was pointing a gun to you and you could take the bullet to save 100 people, would you? You know, I would be like, oh, yeah, if it can save 100 people, why not? You know, that, those 100 people can do a lot more than just I can. So that's always been kind of in my nature to think that. But because they told me they club needed me, they needed me to do this, the night of the elections was when I finally decided okay, I'll run for it. And so like two hours before elections, I told those top four, hey, I think I'm going to run for sergeant at arms. They're like, oh, yes, thank you so much. And so that night I got elected and that all went on. So great stuff. But that's what motivates me. And they didn't know that at the time. So I guess they just got lucky that I was that person that got motivated by people saying they need me. They, you know, they trust me and I trust them. So that's something that also really motivates me. And so, like we said earlier, we have so many things that motivates us. We each have different things. We each have, some of us have similar things, but we all have something that motivates us. And when we know that, like I said, it's really easy to align our resolutions with our motivation. And I think we're all going to be a lot more successful when we do that. But the third thing that motivates me, at least I try to let it motivate me each and every day, is that I know that I'm born again, that I know that Christ, through Christ's sacrifice, I have a second chance. 
Every single day, God gives us a second chance. I think that's the coolest thing about resolutions for us as Christians is that even if we do fail, even if we earn that one week percentage that we can't get by after 70, you know, one week we're 25% who quit, God gives us another chance. We can restart that next day if we want because he has already forgiven us when we ask for it. And that's something that's really awesome for me to think about that and to be motivated by that. And hopefully you all have that motivation too. Hopefully you all can see, wow, God does love me enough that he gives me second chances. So why wouldn't I want to create a resolution to make my life better so I can constantly bring him glory? So I think that's one of the cool things. And if we make resolutions centered on that, that third one right there that we all share in common at least a little bit, that God does in fact love us and give us second chances, I think we're going to succeed a lot more in our life. We're going to make ourselves better people for his kingdom. Uh, and the verse that kind of, I guess, centered around this whole thing, or I guess I wanted to create my resolutions around, was the verse that uh, Sam read for me, Mark 12:30. I'm going to read this, just that verse. And it says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. So centered around that verse, I, was, I wanted to create resolutions for myself for this year. Because usually... I'll make a resolution, I'll just kind of think about it, and I'll try to do it, and obviously that isn't always good. So this year I actually wrote them out on a little note card to be like, okay, these are my resolutions this year, I'm going to try them. So I think when you see something in front of you, I think that increases your odds. I don't know if that's 100% true, but I'm going to guess it is, that it increases your odds to continue on when you constantly are aware of it, constantly seeing it, slash reading it. And so my Mark 12 resolutions are, the first one is my heart resolutions. I'm going to take each one, heart, soul, strength, mind, and break those down into categories. My heart resolutions are to be encouraging to everyone I come in contact with. This one is tough, but look, I'm a pretty optimistic person, so this one isn't too, too difficult for me. Obviously, I get frustrated like everyone else or get impatient at times. But I think this is a pretty a good one to accomplish, showing God's love to people. If I can just be a positive impact on them, even if it's someone I see for like 30 seconds, like going through a drive through somewhere or paying for my gas, if I can just say a positive word to them, give them some sort of affirmation that they're doing a good job or thank you or just, you know, kindness, encouragement. I think that can go a long way and it shows a little outpouring of my heart towards them that I'm trying to love them. So that's my heart resolution for this year. My next one is my mind resolutions and I actually put two for this one. First one is read six books this year. Now, I know some of you are like, six books, Jason, that's hardly any. But for those of you that do know me, you know that reading is not my cup of tea. Uh, I don't hate reading, so to speak, but it's not something that I go after to go do. Like, I'm not like, oh, a book, yes, I'm going to sit down for six hours and read this. Usually it's like, cool, a book, and I just kind of leave it there. And so my goal is to read six books this year. I think I got around six or seven last year, so it's it's a challenge for me to get through that many books. And I want to kind of balance those between fun literature books slash self-help books, so to speak, or, you know, faith-based books, so I can get a good balance of both for this, because I think it's important to constantly challenge our mind and constantly grow in our knowledge, so to speak. And the second one I have is have a conversation with someone once a week on a topic I know nothing about. Now, I know some of you are like, oh, that seems kind of weird, but think about it. That's going to make me have to listen. It's going to make me have to question. That, that's where true knowledge comes from when you're listening, asking questions, trying to get more. So that one's probably going to be really challenging for me because I don't know if you, know, you guys know as, as much as I do, so how can, who am I going to ask these questions to, right? That was obviously a joke. I know most of you are way smarter than I am. Uh, but so those are, that's my, those are my two mind resolutions. And like I said, that second one is going to help me with my ability to listen and learn in that way. My third, my next one is the strength resolutions or the body resolutions. So this one is to try and eat two green meals a week. So that could be just completely salad, maybe even a wrap, maybe if that's a little bit of a stretch. But just something that has vegetables in it. You know, something that has a lot of vegetables in it. Because I... I know that greens are good for us. You know, they don't always taste the best, but I know that they're good for us. And so that's going to be my goal. And I didn't want to like say, oh, I'm going to eat one green meal a day because I know that's absurd and I won't do it. So I just tried to start low. I think that's important to start at a thing you can reach. (laughs) So I'm going to go for two green meals a week, just, you know, get some healthier stuff in me. And the second one is three workouts a week. And I'm sure they're like, but Jason, you look great. You don't work out three times a week? (laughs) No, I do not actually. Thank you for asking. Uh, Especially this last year. Man, I was lazy this last year. I think I maybe worked out like three times the whole year. So three times a week is going to be a stretch, but I think I can pull it off. And as I put on there, more cardio focus to kind of get the heart rate going, you know. I've heard that's better for you. Who really knows? Uh, 
And so the last resolutions are the soul resolutions. Now, I think these ones are probably the most important one for all of us, which is why I put it last. Uh, and my soul resolutions for this year are twice a year, have a day where I completely remove myself, quote unquote, from the grid. You know, I turn off my electronics. I don't have a TV or a computer or my iPhone or an iPod or any of that other eye things you might have or blueberries, all that fun stuff that we can distract ourselves so much. Turn those off. Be alone with God in prayer and in reading scripture. Now, that's going to be a challenge for me because I like to be doing something or at least having something in front of me because I'm, if I'm not doing anything, you can ask Casey, I'm probably going to be on ESPN.com reading some obscure article that I don't really need to know about. So that's kind of my, my tendency to do that. So that's going to be a challenge for me, but I think it's also going to be really good for my soul to get away twice a year. Isn't that often? You know, that's, we have, what, 356 days. And I'm only asking for two of those to spend with God. So that's, that's going to be the challenge is to do that. My second one is have a meal with someone once a month where we discuss our relationships with God. I'm going to make that a priority in our talk where we actually are talking about God, what he's doing in our lives, what he's doing in others' lives. Make that a true priority. I know some of you are like, well, Jason, don't you talk about that every Sunday and Wednesday? You're a youth minister. Uh, well, I do talk about those, but it's usually not a one-on-one -on -one with someone I may not know as well. You know, I occasionally we'll talk about that with the teens. And I'll occasionally even have two or three of them, and I'll, we'll kind of talk about that. But I want to make that a true, I guess, stretching of myself to do it with one person at a time over a meal, because I think that's usually the easiest to get comfortable and relaxed. So those are my two soul resolutions for this year is spend two times a year alone with God, and once a month get with someone to have lunch, talk about God with them. You know, it could be a teen. It could be a parent. It could be one of you guys in here. It could be another minister. It could be someone I know no nothing about, my neighbor, anything. Just as long as I do it once a month, that's the goal. So those are my soul resolutions. And I think that one, just the final one, is the one that's most important probably for all of us to evaluate and look at ourselves. The other three are really great. They're going to help me long-term in my life. But that fourth one is what really matters. That's what's really going to accomplish things for our church body and for God's kingdom, really, because that's the most important thing is what is accomplishing in his kingdom. And so I want to challenge you and encourage you all to make your own soul resolutions this year. You know, and that could be writing out on a card, this is what I'm going to try to do this year for my soul, for me and God, for God and others. You know, the two greatest commandments that Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Those two things. But I really want you to have this verse in mind as you're making this quote-unquote soul resolution. It's from James, James 2.18. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. Now, for those of you that do know me, James is by far my favorite book in the Bible. You know, and I, I think Mark a couple weeks ago said something about that. He's like, I know you're not supposed to have favorites in the Bible, but James is awesome, okay? Because it's real life, it's in your face, it's practical ways to, to live out your faith. And this verse has always resonated with me. Of don't just talk about your faith, but do it. Don't, don't talk the talk, but walk the walk, so to speak. And so as you're making your soul resolutions, think about this verse. And don't just make it centered on just me and God. Don't just say, well, I want to make sure I'm in the word five times a week for at least 15 minutes. Or don't don't just make it, I'm going to make sure I'm praying seven times a week for 10 minutes. Those are really great. Those are great for all of us. We should implement one of those in our lives too. But what I really challenge and encourage you to do is make a soul resolution that stretches your faith, that puts you and others on the line, that makes you have to interact with God's people because that's when it really gets challenging. And you know, maybe as you're kind of thinking this through, you're thinking about what can my soul resolution be for others, for myself and others. I have a couple of maybe suggestions or ideas that might, might help you kind of get your own wheel rolling. Uh, the first one is maybe your soul resolution could be reconnecting with a life group. Maybe over the last year and a half, two years, life's gotten busy and you kind of were like, oh, I really like my Sunday nights or Monday nights or Sunday afternoons, whenever a life group it is that meets. And you're like, I'd rather just be at home and get to relax. And I, I totally get that. Maybe that's your soul resolution though, is I'm going to try to reconnect with a life group again. Maybe yours is you know what, maybe I'm going to start a life group. Maybe I'm going to host one at my home or even co-lead with someone who has one already or co-lead with someone who wants to start one. Maybe that's your soul resolution, that you want to create a new life group for our congregation to help strengthen this body. Maybe your resolution, soul resolution, could be forgiving old friends that have maybe wronged you or reconnecting with old friends 
in this church body or even outside of this church body. Maybe that's your solution to know I need to let go of some of my old, I uh, just blanked on a word I was going to use there, my old angst, my own, I can't think of the word, but I hope you guys know what I'm, what I'm saying there is you can get rid of those old things, that baggage, and that you can move forward. Maybe that's your resolution to forgive others and reconnect with them. Uh, maybe it is you see a new family in the congregation and you're like, you know what? I'm going to get with them once a month and just have dinner with them. That's going to be my sole resolution is to get with a new family in our congregation and try to connect with them. I think that's, that would be a great sole resolution if even 25 of us, 25 of our families made that because that'll mean 25 new families have someone to connect to. That would be huge. Think about the connections and the bonds that we would have just if that happened. So maybe that's your sole resolution. Maybe one, which this one's probably really asking a lot, but maybe it's you're going to plug into a ministry you've never worked with before and you're going to go head first in 110% for this entire year. Maybe that's your story. Maybe it's like, well, I've never worked with the children's ministry. Maybe I'll ask Kathy, okay, use me. I want to do this. Or maybe you'll come and ask me, hey, Jason, what can I do with you? Do it. Maybe it's the hands of Christ or the, there's so many different ministries that we have at our church. Maybe that's your sole resolution is I'm going to plug into something that I haven't done before and give it 100% of my effort. I think that would be also a huge thing for our church because that could grow so many ministries in so many ways and give a lot of unique personalities to those ministries that they probably maybe have never seen before. And like I said before, whatever your sole resolution might be for this year, whatever you decide to make your sole resolution, make it something that is not only just focused on others, but if you'll pull up the next one for me, Dan, but make it that it will challenge and stretch your faith. Make it to where it's not just, oh, I know I can accomplish this, so I'm going to do it. Make it something you have to work for. Make it something where you have to ask for God's forgiveness when you do fail in it. I think because that, that's going to be a big thing. Because when we, when we aren't stretching ourselves, when we aren't challenging our faith, I think our faith gets really stagnant and just kind of bleh. I think our church kind of becomes that way too. If we have a bunch of people in the congregation who are just kind of going through the motions, complacent in our faith, the church starts to look like that. And that's, that's a bad contagious, but it happens. And I, I don't want that to happen for our church. Like I got put up there, God forgives. So don't be afraid of failure if you make a sole resolution and you fail after one week or if you fail after one month. But go after it, because God will forgive you. God loves you, even despite your mishaps and your failures and all that stuff. Don't let failure keep you down, but instead use that as another motivation to be like, I know that God forgave me, so I'm going to improve on that failure. So, you know, maybe you do two weeks of your cell resolution and you fail, and it's like, okay, well, I'm going to make sure I get four weeks this time and just build on it. And like I said earlier, our cell resolutions, we can start new every single day because of what Jesus has done for us. Now, that's awesome. So, like, so just try to get in there and do it. You know, live your faith out. Be that James too. Show people your faith because of how you live, because of what you're doing. And to end it all, I just want to, motiv- I want to ask or hope that you all can find your motivation in our Heavenly Father and you can strive to find ways to better serve him in your life resolutions. And I want to read uh, Ephesians 3.20 as kind of a blessing over all of us. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. Now if there's anything that we can do to serve you, or there's anything you need to come before us, maybe it's to commit your soul resolution to everyone here, now is the time to do that as we stand and sing. People need the Lord. People need the Lord. At the end of broken dreams, he's the open door. People need the Lord. People need Oh.